From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here, and coming up today, K-State's Justin Wagner will talk about strategic marketing of cull beef cows, including sizing up the prospect of holding open cows for winter feeding. Also, one of the featured speakers at the Applied Reproductive Strategies in Beef Cattle Workshop being hosted by K-State this week. Out of the University of Idaho, John Hall will talk about nutrition management for developing replacement heifers. Later, Sarah Moyer talks with Saline County farmer Justin Knopf about his work with K-State in developing conservation farming practices. He'll be featured in a documentary to be aired tomorrow on the Discovery Channel. And with this week's Stop, Look, and Listen, K-State's Gus Vanderhoven. All that right here on Agriculture Today. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension. You're listening to the K-State Radio Network. This is Agriculture Today. Welcome. Well, you cow-calf producers, a few moments for you to consider here. Where you might take a herd production letdown, to put it that way, and turn it into a marketing opportunity. We're talking here about cull cows from the herd. It's a timely matter, and we bring in a research and extension beef systems specialist for K-State based in southwest Kansas to talk it over, Justin Wagner. We're nearing or into preg checking time for those who are running a spring calving herd, Justin, and and they may be coming across some females that are open, and they do have the chance to market those if they strategize this correctly, you say. That's correct. I think there's certainly an opportunity to have some advantages in terms of timely marketing of those uh, cull cows, as, as you put it. And some information from the Kansas Farm Management Association tells us, surprisingly so, that cull cow revenue can be a substantial part of the returns to a cow-calf operation. That's right, Eric. One of the the exercises that I do from time to time, just for a variety of reasons, uh, is to take a look at our Kansas Farm Management Associations and the, the enterprise summaries, and then really kind of do some, I guess, historical tracking of those. And so, if I look at the data from 2010 to 2015, so about a five-year snapshot, and I look at uh, the the sale of, of breeding animals, which in that data set is kind of how they, they classify those, um, we would assume those to, to be cull animals on our average. There was about 20 animals per year that were sold on those operations. Uh, the sale of those 20 animals on, on those operations really amounted to about 24% of the gross income for those operations. And that, that figure kind of surprised me a little bit. Uh, but it tells us that, you know, that the marketing of cull cows or, or cull animals can be a significant source of income for a beef cow calf operation. And we're talking here about situations where producers are simply moving their open cows to the local auction barn, basically, without any extra marketing effort, so to say. That's essentially what what I would take it if we look at, you know, those herds, they would average about 126 cows per operation, um, having about 20 animals. We really don't know as we look at that data set, but, you know, one would kind of assume that those cows are just simply being marketed through a, a local auction terminal, yes. And as with any cattle market, there is a seasonality to price movements. And what you've observed is that the best prices for cull cows take place from mid to late winter into the latter part of summer. So we may be coming to the closing of that prime marketing time. Yeah, as I looked into this issue a little bit deeper, one of the things that I came to the conclusion looking at some some of the marketing data from coal cows is that it's a very cyclic market. The market tends to decline in the, the fall and winter months, uh, especially if we look at a state that tends to be dominated by spring calving herds or an industry. That's when most of those coal cows are, are going to be marketed. And so what you end up with is uh, 
do to supply them. That market goes down a little bit, and then as we get into the summer months, uh, that market tends to go back up again. That trend's been in place for a number of years. If we look at 2016 and, and even all the way back for several years, a 10, 15 year cycle. In fact, as you look at that information that uh, indicates slaughter cow prices in western Kansas, Justin, you find that those prices routinely exceed what producers might, through their experiences, normally assume would be the going rate for cull cows. Yeah, I think a lot of times with producers, you know, if you ask them what's what's the value of a cull cow, you know, the, the answer they'll come back to is, is 50 cents or, or somewhere in that 50 to 60 cent range. And, you know, if you look at our you know, one, the historic 15-year av- running average for, for cull cow prices. Sure enough, during the winter months, October, November, December, January, that 50 to, to 60 cent range would be pretty accurate. However, if you get into the, the summer months, you know, those numbers would be somewhere between 60 and 65. Um, if we go most recently in, in 2016, that the cull cow market actually peaked around 80 cents. And so, that's quite a bit of, of difference from that, you know, value that I think many producers often associate with cull cows of being worth somewhere in the 50 to 60 cents uh, range. So here we are in the very latter stages of August. If one is identifying cull cows now and having in mind they want to move them right away, they, they best be doing so for the optimum prices available. That's correct. And so really what it does is it makes a case for, you know, early pregnancy detection. Mm-hmm. And the earlier we can identify those females that are open, uh, if we can do that and, and market those animals. And I'm going to say kind of the September, October time frame, uh, that market really has, it starts to decline as we look at it historically. It starts to decline in August, but there's still some relatively, you know, it's still relatively strong as we move into September. So if they can be early, identified early and, and go ahead and market them, you know, as soon as possible. However, if that decision or, you know, they're identified and we do preg check a little bit later and it's it's later on, there might be an opportunity to, to add some value just based on the timing of market those cull cows to uh, deferring that into, you know, what I would call kind of the late winter, early spring months. Let's visit about that a, a bit more here. If for one reason or the other, as you say, a producer won't be preg checking for a while and won't be in a position to determine if a cow is open, they can retain those cows later on once they identify them as open. And you suggest putting them on what you call a low input feeding program until the market becomes more favorable. What would constitute a low input feeding program? Well, I think there's lots of different feeding opportunities. You know, one would be that low input type system that that you mentioned. The other would be uh, maybe a what I'd call a, you know a higher input type system. You know, and I think low input. I tend to think forage based, um, maybe in an, in an extensive grazing type system. As I you know, as we start to think about a high input system, my mind tends to gravitate more towards a feeding some sort of a formulated developed ration in a confined setting. Really, I think one of the first things, you know, if you're looking at a, you know, a cull cow marketing opportunity some uh, at some point down the road is to really, you know, take an assessment of what resources that we have available to us on the operation in terms of feed. The other thing is in terms of marketing cull cows, research from both the meat side as well as the cattle performance side and the value side would indicate that the optimum condition to market a cull cow in is a body condition score of six. Um, And that's not too hard to achieve, especially on an open cow. The requirements are relatively low. So we do have, even on a lower input, you know, forage-based system, cows should be able to put on some of that additional weight, especially if we're looking at a situation of 60 to 90 days. You know, if we're looking at maybe that's, you know, simply leaving them with the herd maybe and kind of putting them through uh, milo stocks, corn stocks, really just kind of looking at deferring that marketing decision on down the road. If cows are, are thin enough that we need to put some additional weight on them, we can, in that time frame maybe, and we have the facilities to, to do it, we can go towards a uh, a higher concentrate limit fed type situation. And so there's 
there's a variety of different options that we can put weight on that cow. Important thing to to kind of remember is that you know she's an open cow. Her requirements are relatively low, so really there's there's a number of different opportunities and different strategies from the feeding side that we would be able to utilize to to put some weight on that cow. But as always, one has to walk through this with a pencil and make sure that it's a cost-efficient venture. And if you're, for instance, turning to a concentrate, limit-fed, got to make sure that that's going to be a paying proposition. That's correct. And, and, you know, there is a a labor component of, of both of those type systems. So you need to account for all of that. But we've seen more interest in this in recent years, that is, to add value to the cull cow. And you would encourage producers to give that a closer look, Justin, as opposed to simply loading her up and shipping her to town. You know, certainly, I think most cattle operations, you know, we really tend to view open cows with with kind of a disappointment in her attitude and in their they really might present a, a really nice opportunity to generate some additional revenue and probably one of the biggest factors, you know, with these cull cows that are simply going through a you know, a local auction market is one of the biggest factors, you know, there's really two here. You know, one, what's the condition and weight of the cow and the second one would be the timing of when they market that cow that are gonna be two big drivers in terms of the revenue that's generated from that cow. So keep that in mind. Once more noting, as Justin said, we are soon to enter the down part of the cycle for cull cow prices. So be thinking about getting after this now, or if you're going to be deferring to later on, consider putting those cows into a low input feeding program and uh, penciling out, factoring out just how the economics might work for that. And once more, with the cause of improving the returns to your cow-calf operation any way possible, We appreciate the comments, Justin. Many thanks. Thanks, Eric. That from Justin Wagner. He's a research and extension beef systems specialist for K-State. Justin is based in southwest Kansas. You're listening to Agriculture Today, and we'll be back with more after these moments away here on the K-State Radio Network. Hamburgers. Roast, ribs, steak, or whatever you prefer. Beef, it's what's for dinner. Kansas cattle farmers produce 7.5 million head of cattle per year. It takes about 7 tablespoons of peanut butter to get the same amount of protein in one serving of lean beef. Support your local Kansas farmers and ranchers. Eat beef. This message was brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today and glad to have you aboard. Kansas State University has played host this week to a major conference of researchers and beef cattle producers on applied reproductive strategies in beef cattle. That is the nature and the name of the workshop, and they have several folks from all around the nation speaking on various aspects of beef cattle reproduction, one of which joins us now from the University of Idaho, where he is an extension beef specialist, John Hall, and he talked of heifer development strategies. And John, that's a very broad topic, or can be, but you looked at uh, both pre- and post-weaning possibilities here for managers, for producers to think about. The starting point was selecting an early born heifer for that replacement purpose. You might talk about that. Right, Eric. Thanks. It's nice to be here today. Yeah, one of the things that we've found in research is those those early born heifers uh, reach puberty at an earlier age, and then those heifers breed more efficiently in the breeding season. In addition, those early born heifers are usually out of dams that are highly fertile and well adapted to their environment. When you say early born, how is that defined? Well, the easiest way to define it is the heifers that are born in the first 21 to 30 days of the calving season. So that gives them a head start and gets them on pace to be productive. But beyond that then, pre-weaning management, uh, where does one start, say nutritionally? So with pre-weaning management, what we like to see is those cattle being on pastures that are, have uh, 
a high level of forage availability and high forage quality. And certainly there are some years, either through drought or through fire, that we end up with a shortage of pasture quality for those young developing heifers. You know, that, that heifer, by the time she's five months of age, she's getting less than 30% of her nutrition from her dam, and the rest of it is coming from the forage. So that's really what we want to look at and, and kind of manage that from year to year and, and see if from those unique years when we've got a deficiency of forage quality or availability, then we intervene in some way to supplement that developing heifer. You talked in terms of the average daily gain that's preferred, if not required, pre-weaning for those heifers to get going. What targets should one look at there? Well, pre-weaning, we're really looking at a, a pound and a half to two pounds a day gain on those heifers. Post-weaning, uh, we tend to emphasize a pound and a quarter to a pound and three quarters a day average daily gain. But, but some recent work out in Nebraska and some other locations like Montana have shown us that post-weaning, we might be able to um, go to a lower rate of gain, about a pound a day, and bring those heifers up to a lower target body weight than we had previously thought was needed. You speak of post-weaning. One of the things you advocated in your presentation was sorting heifers by weight for feeding purposes. You might expand on that. Yes. So simply taking heifers, taking the average body weight of a group of heifers, and heifers that are heavier than the average weaning weight put into one group, and heifers that are lighter than the average weaning weight get put into the other group. And then we manage those heifers separately to uh, meet their nutritional goals. So we know that both groups of heifers need to end up at approximately the same weight prior to breeding, but we might want to increase the rate of gain on those lightweight heifers, also give them a chance not to be beat away from the bunk uh, from those larger heifers. In addition, we can prevent those older heifers or those larger heifers from over-consuming feed and becoming too fat and having reproductive problems as a result of being too fat. So that can hopefully lead to all heifers in that group being on an even nutritional keel. It would also gain some efficiencies in feed resource utilization, wouldn't it? Yes, certainly, because the heavier heifers, we can reduce their intake a little bit and have them not overconsume, and so therefore we're not feeding as much feed as we would if we put all those heifers together in one group. Something else you addressed in your presentation something that's called the pattern of gain, that is when to ramp up that gain within that feeding period. And you more or less said that the pattern of gain isn't as important as folks might think. Yes, Eric, it seems like from, from the research that's been done, it doesn't matter whether those heifers gain rapidly immediately after weaning and then kind of coast through the winter, or if they're uh, fed at a more moderate rate, maybe they're on crop residues during the fall, and then go through the winter at a fairly low rate of gain. But then in late winter and early spring, at least 60 days prior to the breeding season, we bring those heifers up and get them to gain at a higher rate. So regardless of whether they gain that weight early or late, as long as they're reaching the target weight that's desired, we see those heifers performing equally well. Some other aspects, John, if we might quickly hear the role of protein in these heifer development diets. Of course, a lot of attention is paid to energy, but how much does one need to focus on the protein aspect? I think the main aspect of protein is that we want to meet those protein requirements for those developing heifers, which usually is 10 to 12 percent crude protein in the diet, somewhere along uh, along that range. It would depend on the weight of the heifer and the amount of pounds that we're trying to get that heifer to gain. We don't want to overfeed protein, primarily from an economic standpoint. There's limited data that says that if we overfeed too much rumen degradable protein, we can see some negative effects on reproduction. But by and large, that level of protein in the diet has to be extremely high, uh, like coming from urea or, or another non-protein nitrogen source. While we're talking about other components, what about ionophores and their place in the heifer development diet? Well, ionophores are an excellent addition to post-weaning heifer diets. Not only do we see the increase in feed efficiency, but in many cases we have also seen enhanced reproductive performance in terms of earlier age of puberty and slightly higher pregnancy rates. To target weights then, there's a debate you noted amongst your peers about what that might be in terms of getting that heifer up to speed pre-breeding. 55% versus 65% is how you couch that. That is, as a percent of mature weight. And what to think about there, and, and what's more appropriate? 
Well, that's a real touchy subject. I guess it depends on, on who you are. You know, for a long period of time, 65% was our recommendation. And, and again, that level of recommendation kind of gave us a level of forgiveness that we had that we could give producers a target weight to hit and that that would mean that nutrition would not be limiting for that heifer's reproductive performance. More recently, uh, research has shown us that we could go back down to about 55% mature weight as long as those uh, heifers are continuing to, to reach puberty. And so I guess my recommendation is you really need to think about your operation and what your operational goals are. For a lot of commercial herds that are out on range or making extensive use of crop residues, maybe the 55% is a more appropriate target because we're challenging those heifers to reach puberty at a lighter weight an earlier age and, and become reproductively efficient. And it also can decrease the feed costs involved with the developing those heifers by doing that. A key with that 55% target weight is that those heifers need to continue to gain weight during the breeding season. So it's very necessary that during the breeding season that uh, we have high-quality pastures for those heifers or high-quality range for those heifers that are being developed onward so that they end up at about 85% of mature weight by the time they're calving. The 65% level may be more advantageous to smaller herds that, that don't have the luxury of having a few more open heifers or to maybe some purebred operations that are trying to maximize uh, their genetic potential in their herd. You're getting at this, again, another point you pressed in your presentation. One wants to design this program around the resources available. Exactly. If your resources are, are plentiful, then we can probably go to the higher target weights because those animals are going to operate in that environment probably for the rest of their lives. If your resources are, are more limited or, they're, or we're trying to make better use of lower quality forages, then you probably want to develop those heifers in that environment and for that type of environment. John, you had a wealth of information in your presentation. We hardly have time to cover it all, but one final thought consistency is key here is it not within the feeding program you don't want to uh, spike your feeding regimen at any point nor dip it down too low well i think we need to be careful on how how we utilize that that consistency again we've obviously seen that we can change rates of gain those heifers do fine with those changes in rates of gain so i think what the main thing is we need to be careful of when we change those rates of gain that if we are going to make a significant change from maybe a low level of gain to a high level of gain, we do that far enough in advance of the breeding season that the animal has time to respond. And, but you are correct. We don't want to see gains fluctuating wildly from week to week. We were, if we're, you're on a low rate of gain. We want to see that for an extended period of time, followed by at least two months worth of a high rate of gain. Producers need to focus on that development program from all vantage points, it seems, and, and really map out where they want to be. Yes, we've talked about a nutrition in my particular talk, but certainly animal health, animal handling, uh, reproductive technologies that have been covered in, in this particular conference, as well as genetic goals for the herd all have to be considered in a heifer development program. John, it's a pleasure to have you here in Manhattan and at Kansas State University for this conference and your presentation, very well received and very informative. We do appreciate your time with us right here as well. Thank you, Eric. I've enjoyed my time at K-State uh, at this conference. Thank you very much. That's Dr. John Hall from the University of Idaho, an extension beef specialist, one of the featured speakers at the 2017 Applied Reproductive Strategies in Beef Cattle Workshop, hosted by the Animal Sciences and Industry Department at K-State. And there's more to come from that conference later on this week here on Agriculture Today. Did you eat today? Thank a farmer. A way to get more involved in agriculture is through 4-H and FFA. Through 4-H and FFA, we have been given multiple opportunities to grow as leaders and learn more about agriculture. You can learn skills related to jobs, public speaking skills, and you get the opportunity to travel around the country and meet new people. If you want more information about getting more involved in 4-H and FFA, visit them on their websites at kansasffa.org and kansas4h.org.
Welcome back to Agriculture Today. I'm Sarah Moyer with a special K-State graduate from the class of 2000. Justin Knopp is here with us near Gypsum, Kansas. He is being featured in a film documentary, Rancher, Farmer, Fisherman specifically for his sustainability practices that he uses on his farm operation, whether that be through K-State Research and Extension Resources or otherwise. And it's good to have you on, Justin. Yeah, I appreciate the opportunity, Sarah. One key piece of your sustainability practices is your willingness to be experimental and try new ways to improve both your farming practices short term but also long term. Would you talk about how that works for you? Oh sure, yeah. You know, I through this process that was one clear theme that was important to me that came across in the book and in the film and Miriam did a fantastic job of bringing that out of just continual improvement over time. And I think that's important to farmers. And it's also one of the real important things, I think, as we're hearing more about sustainability through the supply chain and companies wanting to understand more of the sustainability footprint, if you will, of the products consumers are purchasing, whatever that's defined as. And so I think inherently as farmers, and certainly in our operation, we're always thinking about improvement across time. And we have a pretty long, ever since I've been back farming full time, which was in 2003 uh, with my dad and brother, we have carried on and continue to carry on on farm research projects that we've partnered with Tom Maxwell, our excellent local extension agent for agronomy in our extension district here in central Kansas. And he's, ever since we started doing those, helped me lay out the experimental design, make sure it's replicated and randomized, scientifically sound, helps take in observations, and then we just use that information to fine tune our decision making. Another important theme of the book and the film is how there's not one perfect system. Of course, we utilize a no-till system in our farm, but no-till system has its weaknesses as well. The book did a really nice job of highlighting, and Miriam really had an understanding of, in farming, it's a process of determining which choice has the least amount of trade-offs. And part of the learning and improvement over time is understanding those trade-offs and evaluating them and making a choice of what production practice or what cropping system or even a specific management decision has the least amount of trade-offs. What other partnerships have you participated in with K-State Research and Extension? Yeah, I can't overstate the value and the importance of the partnership that our farm perceives with our partnership with K-State Research and Extension. It's no doubt that K-State is an essential business partner at our management table. From agronomy, from some of the agronomic studies that we're partnering with with K-State that they're carrying out on some of our fields to on-farm research that we're carrying out that they're helping us analyze and set up so it's scientifically sound, to K-State Farm Management. I'm a member of K-State Farm Management Association, and so the economics, this is a very uh, challenging time to see where profits will be on the farm, so really looking at costs. So really at many levels in our business is K-State influencing and having impact on our farm. Those partnerships, the foundation was really built while I was a student at K-State in the Department of Agronomy. So when Miriam, the author of the book, first came out to learn about our farm and kind of my history and and being conservation-minded, one of the first things I did was drive her up to Manhattan and go to campus and walk around Throckmorton Hall and talk to Dr. Brzezinski, Dr. Rice, some of the folks that were really instrumental in laying a foundation for me to think about conservation and to think about stewardship and incremental improvement over time and how the, really how the whole system fits together. So that's where the foundation started from. And since then, it's just really built across time. It, we partner with Alan Fritz. He has a wheat breeding nursery on our farm close by each year. That's led to placing a mesonet station close by to our farm, which has been a great value to not only us, but our entire community. Ignacio is doing a lot of cropping system research, looking at satellite imagery and using satellite imagery to predict yield response before we harvest the fields. And then it's really valuable to me to take that type of information and be able to quickly make variable rate management zones within a field. 
So as a student, that's where that foundation was really built. And across time, it's just become an increasingly mutually beneficial relationship and will continue to do so. And if other farmers are interested in becoming more sustainable, what would you advise them to do starting off? It's important to me that the audience understood as I was communicating in this film and book that there's nothing magical about what's happening here. And I think sustainable is an incredibly difficult word to define and it has so many definitions. And so, you know, when I think about it, I think about stewardship and conservation and I think about staying power for the long term. So sustainability to me has an economic piece, an environmental piece, and then also a social piece of the health of our family, of my brother and I's kids, and our relationships with our wives and our marriages, and how well our community is doing in our local school. So to me, those are all pieces of sustainability in my definition. I think I would, again, emphasize just incremental improvement over time and being open-minded, asking hard questions about how can I improve, or when I read something in a magazine to where a consumer is saying this about a farm, just you know, making sure that I understand where is the truth at and making sure that if that's a concern consumers have, that that concern is being addressed on my farm if it's something that actually does need addressed. So I think the values that we hold as family farms and ranches are still much the same values that our urban counterparts share as well in their own families. And if we can be transparent with those values that are important to us and show this incremental improvement across time, I think that goes a long ways for trust. Whether producer or consumer, folks are invited to enjoy the documentary, which airs August 31st on the Discovery Channel. They're starting to advertise it on the Discovery Channel, so I suspect if that's a channel folks watch, they will see it. There'll be other media events happening, hopefully throughout the state in time, maybe at K-State this fall, and so stay tuned for some of that information. Excellent. Well, thank you, Justin, for coming on and speaking with us today. You're welcome. Pleasure to partner with you guys. Once again, that's Justin Knopp. He is here north of Gypsum, Kansas, and he is being highlighted in a documentary Rancher, Farmer, Fisherman, and that will be airing on the Discovery Channel, so you can tune in there, and producers out there are looking to become more sustainable. Of course, K-State Research and Extension has resources and agents to partner with. Did you know every Kansas farmer feeds 128-plus people? Kansas farmers are hard workers, dependable, authentic, and sensitive. Not only do farmers put food on your table, but they put clothes on your back and fuel in your car. For more information about Kansas farmers, visit K-State Research and Extension online or stop by your local Extension office. This message has been brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. This is Agriculture Today. Stop, look, and listen. This is our state, Kansas. Talking to a colleague in the hall of Throckmorton on campus, I held the door for an entering student and bid her, please come in. That's Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with comment on life in rural Kansas. It's a week ago that the university started again with classes. The fall semester has begun. They actually started one day late because of the eclipse event on Monday, August 21st. That weekend, the stragglers arrived in town and brought trucks or trailers loaded with stuff, furniture, mattresses, bookcases, and all. It's quite a sight when they come to town to set up their living quarters. With students back, driving in town takes extra care. Go slow, especially at crossings. Then there are the bicyclists who need, demand their space, and rightly so. If I think about the scooters, I get nervous. Many riders do not wear helmets. They sit on the scooter like sitting on a kitchen chair and happily crisscross across campus. Some have never driven through a roundabout. 
campus is changing its traffic pattern. The inner part is now more for walking and biking, and the cars more on the periphery. It does make sense. But with the students back in town, the town comes alive again. Aggieville is humming. It is good. And I expect it's the same for all university towns. Lawrence, Wichita, Hayes, Emporia, Pittsburgh, and where our community colleges are. Talking to a colleague in the hall of Throckmorton on campus, I held the door for an entering student, and I bid her, please, come in. She looked slightly surprised, and then I added as she passed me, now remember, you are paying, and demand the best. When it sank in what I had said, she laughed, and it seemed she walked on with a lighter step, carrying the heavy-loaded backpack. It was not the first time I've made that remark. Welcome. Remember, you're paying and demand the best. The fact is, that is what I believe. I also believe that not everyone needs to go to college to be successful in life. The proof is in my own family. But once in college, do not waste the opportunity nor time especially those for whom tuition is paid, and especially not for those who have earned their tuition by joining the military. Those who have been on the front line know the risk they took to earn their tuition. Don't ever think or say free tuition. It's not free. Both Anik and I are mentoring two young men, both Marines. The first year in school was tough, but they made it. Now the one, a student here at KSU, has started his second year after working hard at a local nursery this summer. He's following the path of landscape architecture. I hope to be alive when he graduates. It's still a long way, but he has the dream. We talk, I push, and show him what it is all about. But I can only show so much. I want his professors and fellow students to encourage him. Of course, it is ultimately up to him. But we must encourage and teach. Really, teaching is a tough job. There's nothing easy about it. If you're not tired after teaching, you haven't taught. I taught at VPI Blacksburg, Virginia, years ago. I enjoyed it. It was work, as it should be. Remember... The students pay, pay to be taught and learn. Also, not all students are A students. And mind you, I have seen A students fail in the real world. I've shared with you earlier my own lesson in learning when I was a student at Hawkesbury Agricultural College in Richmond, Australia. As students, we had to work and participate at the annual Royal Sydney Agriculture Show. It was a big event, lasting a whole week. I judged the Corridale sheep, and I won the second prize, a silver medal. Afterwards, I went to my livestock prof, and I said to him, Thank you for teaching me. I won against the Aussies, who know sheep inside and out. Of course, I absorbed the teaching, but the start is teaching for which you get paid. But you better make it good. And it doesn't need to be fun, although a good sense of humor helps. I liked VPI. It gave me a chance to teach while I worked to earn my PhD in landscape and environmental horticulture. I came to Kansas to use it as an extension specialist. And as my wife says, I suited the job and the job suited me. I enjoyed it. Actually, It was much more than a job. We made Kansas and Kansas State our home. Those of you who get the National Geographic, take a good look at the September issue. It came in the mail a few days ago. And on page 82 is an article. A tiny country feeds the world. Agriculture giant Holland is changing the way we farm. It's a fascinating article. 
but on page 104 is a double page, a photo of a group of students inside a greenhouse. What speaks to me is the short paragraph describing the drive in the Netherlands. Here it is. Knowledge is the Netherlands' most valuable export, say instructors and students at Wageningen University and Research, where half of all graduate students hail from other countries. Knowledge. That is what we want our students to have, real knowledge. And how to use it, I want them to think. Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with his weekly commentary on rural Kansas. That rounds out our Wednesday edition. Thanks for being along with us. And for Sarah Moyer, Eric Atkinson here for Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.